Welcome to The Crossing Online. We're so glad that you decided to join with us today. We are in our series called The Mandela Effect. It's an incredible series, all about things that we all thought were true, but they actually aren't. It's an amazing series, and I can't wait to get into it. If you wanna join in with our community, then come hang out in the chat. We love meeting new people and getting people connected with others that watch online. Service is getting ready to start, so let's jump into some amazing worship. You are the one, you are the one that is faithful. You are the one, you are the one that is able to give us strength, to give us help in our trials. You are the only one, you are the only one.
Well, how's everybody doing today? You guys doing good? So glad to have each and every single one of you join in from all of our different locations, from online, inside, .tv. We're just so thrilled to have you here. And if you're a part of our church for the very first time, you walked in the doors at one of our locations for the first time, you tuned in online for the first time, we are exceptionally glad that you're here. And our hope is that God will use the time that we have together today to draw you and everybody else into a more intimate, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. If you've been around the crossing uh, for a while now, you know that we're in this two-year adventure called Wreck the Roof. And Wreck the Roof is a big deal because it has re uh, required a huge step of faith for every single one of us as we followed God's lead in the area of our generosity. And we're doing this so that way we can take even more ground in our surrounding communities to help all the people that we know all the people that we love and all the people we don't know to come into an intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And our Mammoth location that launched a couple of weeks ago was a part of this Wreck the Roof initiative, the camp where we had over 1,400 kids go to this past summer was a part of this Wreck the Roof journey as well. And, but our primary goal has been 100% engagement. And it has been amazing to see all the life change that has happened in so many people all across the crossing that have made Wreck the Roof generosity commitments. Well, Rochelle is just one of those many stories. And I can't wait for you to hear how God asked her to wreck the roof of her generosity, even though she wasn't gonna be around to personally see it. This is a story of true sacrifice, and I wanna encourage you to dial in and hear not only what she says, but maybe what God wants to speak to you today personally as we watch this video. I'm Rochelle Porter. Um, I've been going to the crossing in Hannibal for, well, since 2011, and uh, currently 
at Northwest pursuing a degree in ag business. When I started going to Hannibal in 2011, I was just kind of floating by, just laying under the radar. I was just a member, I wasn't really doing anything, and then um, I just started following my faith and like making it my own. And then in that time, um, I ended up moving up into the high school ministry, and um, I got really, I had a drive and a fire, so I just started uh, volunteering in Fuse, and I've been doing that for quite a while now, um, leading a girls' Bible study there. And uh, by going to the crossing, I've been able to dig in and dive deep into what God has in store for my life. And um, I've been able to run with that. I got baptized in 2014. Um, and was I've just had a drive since then. So as I went into my rec through of commitment, um, I was not really planning on God to do anything in my life. Um, as I was leaving for college in six months, and the duration of it was mainly around two years. So I didn't really think my finances, my time, myself um, would be any benefit to that, um, seeing I wouldn't see it through in two years. But uh, I just started diving into prayer, listening to what God had to say for me. And um, he was like, you know, you're tithing, that's great, but I think you should go you should triple that. And I was like, what? You're crazy. Oh, I'm just, just going to pretend you didn't say that. So I ran from it for a while, and uh, he's like, no, that's really what I want you to do. And I was like, all right, well, I'll just do it. And it was kind of a scary time because I worked for my dad selling cars in mobile homes, and we were really slow at the time. And um, it was kind of scary slow almost. And I was like, all right, I'll just, I'll just do what I got. So I was kind of nervous also because of the whole like going to college thing kind of cost some money and um, so I just leaned in just had what God had in store for me followed through and like immediately business started picking up um, it was we we're almost so busy to keep up and uh, just before I kind of left for college I ended up getting a few more scholarships which brought my bill down to like pretty close to nothing I don't know I, I assume it's the same for every campus but like when you're just in the ministry with everybody. It's just like a big family and you spend all your time together. And I was afraid that coming to college, like there's a, it's like way bigger than my town, um, that I wasn't gonna find a ministry to dive into. I wasn't gonna have good Christian friends to surround myself around. My church family wasn't gonna be the same. And um, I've just been so lucky with that. The first day I got invited to go to this group called The Navigators and um, I just have really dove in on that. I'm joining their leadership team called Joshua Team, um, where they just build up leaders. And I have started to go to this church called The Bridge, and they currently have no middle school or high school ministry. So I've kind of taken that and run with that with a team of two other people, and we have launch off for the first ministries the first of October. Honestly, um, I feel like I'm being called into full-time ministry, and this is a gateway into that. I would say if you are struggling that, um, just listen to what God has in store for you because it's so cool to see. So for instance, Monmouth just got launched. Um, I can know that I had a small part in that. Um, I'm really just looking for the whole big picture after the two years is complete to see how much it's grown, how many people have been able to be touched by the Word of God and just you know surrender their lives to God, it'd be awesome. Isn't that story amazing? Uh, her story inspires me and it challenges Jennifer and I as we think about our very own Wreck the Roof commitment. And I wanna encourage all of you today in two ways. First, if there are some of you in here that are like me and Jennifer and Rochelle and you've made a Wreck the Roof commitment, this journey is about so much more than just writing a number down on the card last spring. It is about living it out. And I want to encourage you to join us, join Rochelle and join so many others across all of our different locations and online to live out your commitment. See what God will do. Some of you may need to start 
start giving on your commitment card that you made, you can literally do that today. We still have 19 months left of Wreck the Roof, and I wanna encourage you all to step out in faith and see what God will do. And others of you, you're either newer to the crossing and don't know much about Wreck the Roof, or maybe you're someone who is around but you didn't formally participate. I wanna encourage you to join us. Don't miss out on this. If you want more information, you can go to wrecktheroof.org when you get home today and join us on this journey. Or better yet, you could start giving at the very end of our services during the closer time. There'll be a person on stage who will give you some direction on how to do that and see what God will do in you and through you as you follow Jesus' lead to wreck the roof of your faith, your lifestyle, and your generosity. Just to kind of close this moment right here, I wanna just pray, not only for us, but I wanna pray specifically for Rochelle and the ministries that she's getting ready to launch at her church. Would you guys across all of our locations, just real quick, would you just uh, close your eyes and pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this moment we have right now where we get to be together and, and I get to pray a prayer that's 300 miles wide and all that's possible, God, because of you. Right now, I just ask you to be with Rochelle and the people that she's partnering with to start a ministry uh, to kids that don't have a ministry and that there would be people there that would find an intimate, personal relationship with you. God, I'm also just asking that you'd be with our time together today, that every single one of us would be brought closer in that intimate, personal relationship with you because we know that when, the more we know about you, the more we'll fall in love with you and that your love can change us. In your name I pray, amen. Well, I hope you guys are doing well today, and I really hope you've been enjoying this Mandela Effect sermon series. How many of you across all of our locations, you've been kind of enjoying this? How many of you are enjoying all the trivia questions that have been coming up? It's been causing some controversy, some frustration. Well, to those of you who are new to the crossing, we're in this sermon series, The Mandela Effect, and the Mandela Effect is a name given to a, a, a group of people misremembering an event. And it was given the name, uh, the Mandela Effect, because Nelson Mandela, a large group of people, remember him dying in the 80s, and another group of people remember him dying in the 90s, even though that is not true. And what we've been learning as a church is that it doesn't just happen in history or in events, but we can have a, the Mandela Effect happen in our lives spiritually that there are things we believe about God that just simply are not true or things that we believe happen in our relationship with God that simply did not take place. So every single week we've been sending out questions online and giving you guys an opportunity to answer the poll. Uh, all but one of them, everybody has been right on uh, and I'm assuming that today will be no different. Here is the first one. What is the correct spelling of the classic liquid typo fixer? Is it white out with a W-H or is it white out with a W-I? How many of you guys are millennials and you don't know what white out is? Okay, that's fun. All right, here's how you guys answered. 65% of you said you're in the W-H club. 35% of you said you were in the W-I club. The correct answer is get out of here. Real quick, how, okay, this is mainly for people who use typewriters, uh, but how many of you were the kind, and I actually, this was me for a period of my life, you didn't use white out, you would just crumple the whole paper up and start from scratch. You're a perfectionist, yep, God heal you, okay? He's healing me too. All right, here's the second question I have for you. What does the evil queen say to the mirror in Snow White? Magic mirror on the wall, who's the fairest one of all? Or mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest one of all? All right, across all of our locations, how many of you think it's number one? How many of you think it's number two? Okay, this is how you guys responded online, which is about right. 19% said it's magic mirror on the wall, and 81% people said mirror, mirror on the wall. The correct answer is... There's a revolt. I know some of you, I see it. I'm seeing people shaking their heads going, I don't trust this guy. I hear you. I, I'm, it, the Mandela effect is real. And I know because you're not gonna listen to a word I say unless I resolve this conflict, I have proof. Who is the fairest one of all? 
Is, can we trust anything anymore? Okay? All right. Here is the third question. True or false? You have felt that God was distant, and here's how you guys responded. 73% believe this to be true. Jerry, at the very beginning of this sermon series, he made a statement that I've really been clinging to, and I keep reminding you about it, and this is the statement he made. We create the distance, and Jesus closes it. Well, last week in his sermon, he uh, made another statement that I want to make sure I put in front of you guys, and this is what he says. I'd rather be in the valley with Jesus than on the mountaintop without him. And I actually want these two um, sentences to kind of form the framework of my time with you this morning. And uh, while I was working on the sermon for next weekend, I'm sitting at my house, and uh, I'm taking a break from writing. The kids are uh, running around. Jennifer's watching a show, and... I just happened to see a notification on my phone, and uh, it was just a, a, a sweet lady who goes to our church, and it was a, a long uh, message about just some hardship that's going on in her life, and uh, so I started to do a response, and then I, I'm a horrible writer, and I'm like, this is going to be, this is just going to be bad, so I just said, thanks so much, hey, just here's my number, whenever you get a chance, give me a call. And about 15 minutes later, the phone rings. And uh, as soon as she uh, calls me, I pick up the phone. One of my kids like careens into something and is crying all over the place. So I'm like, hey, I have to call you back. And uh, <laughs> I'm so sorry. So after I go upstairs, I tuck the kids in bed. I, I, I pick up the phone. I get to talk to this girl. And she's, uh, her and her family are right now, either this service or next service. They are um, in a, uh, a room with grandma who's passing away. And one of the questions she had is, I just don't feel close to God. At the end of that conversation, really cool news, she decided to make Jesus Christ her Lord and Savior. And when she gets back to the Macomb campus, she's going to get baptized. But this message, I hope you get to hear this. Thank you so much for talking to me on the phone last night. And I pray that God will use this to draw you even, even closer and give you peace in the middle of your pain. Because there have been moments in my life where it just gets hard. Things just aren't going the right way, and you find yourself in situations and circumstances that are just not easy. They're just painful. They're just hard. Has anybody, you've walked through a, a moment of heartache, you've walked through a moment of pain or loss, and you've just been going, man, I, I don't get it. Like, in this moment, I felt like I needed God the most, and he was nowhere to be found. I love what I get to do, uh, love what I get to do for a living. I, I cannot adequately explain to you how much uh, I love uh, being a pastor and more specifically being a pastor at this church. But I'll ask, sometimes people ask me what being in ministry is like and I will tell them um, ministry is a lot like people just calling you in the morning and saying, hey, I'm gonna get in a, in a car wreck later this afternoon, didn't know if you wanted to go with me. That's really what it is. You want to sit in the front seat. Uh, because most of the time, people aren't calling us because they're like, hey, just wanted to call and tell you, things are fantastic. <laughs> Hope you have a great day, too. We don't get a lot of those phone calls. We get these phone calls. Uh, so-and-so just got arrested. We get uh, so-and-so just uh, got out of a bad relationship. Uh, so-and-so, man, we're going through a divorce. Someone picks up the phone. Yeah, I cheated. Man, there's an affair in our home. You get the phone call. Someone just, they just went to be with the Lord. That's the phone calls we get. Now, listen to me. I am not saying that to ever, ever, ever make you not make that phone call. You need to know this. I'm so thankful I get to serve with great elders at our church, great staff, incredible difference makers and, and life group leaders. We want to be in those moments with you. The, the, it would be a shame for you to walk through those alone. But sometimes you get in the car because you love someone, you, you go through the, the pain with that person, and even for me sometimes, I'm going, God, where, where were you on this one? It's, it was a day that started like any other day. And I got one of those phone calls. A dear, 
dear family friends uh, from the Macomb campus, and um, their son uh, was being rushed to the hospital. And I mean, I got in the car, drove as fast as I could. As soon as I got there, the staff and doctors are opening up every door from me in the parking lot all the way to uh, the room where they was. And by the time I got there, there was a sheet all the way over his body. Now, I had talked, I had talked to this kid the previous week. The father's sitting there with his hand on his son's knees, and I come up and I put my hand on his back, and I put my hand on his son's arm, and I'm just sitting there praying, and I'm praying, and I'm praying. And I'm fully aware that, that God could do something amazing in that moment. I'm wishing in that moment I had all the right words to say. I, I didn't know what to pray. I didn't even know how to express what was happening in my heart. I was just... And even though God was there, I didn't see him. I didn't feel him. I felt like my prayers were just bouncing off the ceiling. They got stuck in the ceiling tiles. And I don't know if there's anybody at all of our locations where you've had those moments where you've experienced that kind of pain and you've asked yourself those questions. Well, I think when we go through these difficult circumstances, we have a tendency to put God in one of three categories. The first category is that God is emotionally distant. And we do that because we have some people in our lives who have functioned as emotionally distant people. Uh, another word for emotionally distant is passive aggressive. Men, listen to me for just a second. See if you can relate. You are almost positive you've done something wrong to frustrate her. You are convinced that you messed up somewhere, somehow. And you go, hey, are we okay? And she says, oh, we're fine. We're fine. We're fine. Are you sure? Because I'll be honest with you, I, I feel like I'm pretty sure I did something. I'm not sure what it is, but I, can, I just don't feel like everything's right. Oh, everything's just fine. It is just fine. Okay. Uh, you, you positive? Yeah. They are emotionally distant. They're not going to engage in what the real problem is. And I think sometimes we get into our relationship with God and we're like, he's being emotionally distant. He's not, he's not engaging. He keeps telling me that everything's fine, but I know in my heart that I must have done something to create some, some pain, which is why they're emotionally distant. Ladies, here's one for you. The second category we sometimes put God in is in the verbally distant category. Women, see if you can relate. You try and talk to him and he doesn't say anything. You call him and he doesn't pick up the phone. You say, hey, can you hear me? And he gives you nothing back. He's given you the silent treatment. And you know somewhere along the line something's wrong, but he's not gonna tell you what. I'm just gonna. <laughs> right? And I think sometimes we get into our relationship with God and we're like, why won't you talk back to me? I'm, I wanna know. And yet you don't hear anything from heaven. And then the third category is obviously the physically distant. There you were in your darkest moment and they walked out and walked away. Oh, they were there for you in the good times when things were going well, but all of a sudden when the pain intensified, when the cost increased, in the moment when you needed them the most, you had to go through it alone. And I think there's times when that's how we feel about God, like he was with us when everything was right. But now that things are tough, you walked out. And you asked me to walk it alone. I think a lot of us from time to time tend to believe that God is distant. And what I'm hoping to do today in the time I have is I wanna give you just three pictures that we find in scripture that tell you the exact opposite, that show you that God is close. The first picture is in 1 Corinthians 3.16. Do you not know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you. Second Timothy 1 4 says, Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. 
Imagine this is your life for a second. Literally, Jesus lives inside of here. He takes up residence in your life. When you start an intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ, Acts chapter two tells us this story. The people say, what should we do to be saved? He says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes and he takes up residence in your life. He is with you. How far away from you is he? He's skin deep. Like, he's never further away from you than your skin. He lives inside of you. While I'm on that, just a quick message to all of you really skinny, in shape people. You're making such a small place for him to live. I mean, I know from the worldly perspective it's cute, but you keeping Jesus locked up in a one bedroom apartment just isn't right. That's why some of us have decided to build him a mansion, a five bedroom, four car garage, so he has all the room in the world, right? He lives inside of you. Picture number one, this is you. Jesus lives inside of you. He is with you everywhere you go. Picture number two. The Holy Spirit helps us in our prayers. Romans chapter eight, verse 26 says, in the same way the Spirit, everybody say this word, helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for. How many of you have ever been there? You've been in this situation. I don't even know what to pray what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. How many of you in the past uh, two years you've had to move? You had to move out of your house and you had to call people? How many of you are the people that actually get those phone calls? Oh yeah. It's like if you get a truck and a trailer, it's like a sign to all your friends that says, I'm free every weekend and I like heavy objects, right? <laughs> now. How many of you, when you were moving, you put out plenty of phone calls, but only a couple people called back? That's how you find out how your real friends are. That's how you prune the tree. You just pretend that you're moving. All the people who don't show up, you know, are not your friends. All the people that do show up, you're like, I was just joking. We're having steaks. I just wanted you to know you're a good friend, okay? That's one way to do it. All right, now, the word in the Greek here for helps is sunanti lambanomai. Everybody say sunanti. Lambanomai. Let me explain to you what that word means. I'm gonna need my friend Joe Dirt to come on out here for just a second. This is one of my new favorite people. He's been hanging out here a bunch and he just reminds me of Joe Dirt. Come on, everybody. would you give him a round of applause? Isn't he great? I love him. All right, now, here's what sunanti lambanomai means. It means together on the other side to take hold. The Bible's telling us is when the Holy Spirit helps us in our prayers, he comes alongside of us on the other side to take hold. So, hold on, together, on the other side to take hold. How many of you have had a prayer, had a situation in your life that was too big for you? You couldn't lift it on your own, I can try as I want, but I'm not gonna be able to get this whole thing off the ground. It's too big for me. You've had a situation that you're praying over and you never thought you'd have to pray those kind of prayers. You never thought you'd have to formulate those words. To be honest with you, you don't even have the words to formulate. You don't even know what to pray for. The Holy Spirit comes alongside on the other side to take hold and together you're able to lift a prayer to God that you could not lift yourself. Thank you so much, Andrew. Do you see what he's doing? Yeah, he's great. The Holy Spirit comes alongside of us and he takes hold to carry our desires, to carry our prayers to God. He's the true friend that walks in when everybody else walks out. You're in that moment where you're going, I don't even know what to pray. The Holy Spirit literally is like saying, I got this. Here's another way of looking at it. Uh, I don't know if you guys get a big kick out of having people uh, pray with you or pray over you, but uh, this past weekend I had a, a person come up and just ask me to, to pray over them, and I prayed with them. And then, of course, I get completely emotionally connected when I pray with somebody, so then I'm going, all right, I gotta buy them a book, I'm gonna send them a book, I gotta make sure that, they, that something happens after that. But not only do I like praying over people, I actually love it when people pray over me. Before uh, Jerry and I come out and preach, our elders pray 
uh, over us a couple weeks ago in my inbox, Walt Wilcoxon, our campus pastor in Lima. I opened up my email and there was a prayer over me. The Holy Spirit is interceding on your behalf. He is praying over you all the time. You've got the Holy Spirit praying over you. You've got Jesus living in your heart and you've got the Holy Spirit praying over you and helping you carry your prayers to heaven. That's picture number two. Picture number three. When the angels were announcing the arrival of Jesus, one of the nicknames that they said that Jesus would go by was the name Emmanuel. And then the scriptures tell us what Emmanuel means. It means God with us. Well, in John chapter one, verse 14, something interesting happens. We find this passage of scripture. The word became flesh and made his, everybody say this word, dwelling among us. The word, this is Jesus, Jesus became flesh and made his dwelling among us. The word here means literally to set up a tent. It means to set up a tent. Now to the Jewish people that would have read this, this was a pretty interesting statement because we use the word tent, but this, the writers would have used the word tabernacle. Now this is just a little fun extra stuff for those of you who have grown up in church most of your life. Uh, if you remember all the way back in uh, the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, as Moses is leading the people out of Egypt, out of captivity, and they're moving through the desert, God commands them to build a tabernacle, a huge tent, and that God would dwell in that tent. His presence would be in that tent. And then when the people set up camp, they would put the tabernacle where God was right in the middle of the camp and there'd be three tribes to the north and three tribes to the south and three tribes to the east and three tribes to the west. He would be right in the middle of his people. So a Jewish person starts reading this passage of scripture and they go, basically as they would read it, they said the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. That when Jesus came here to earth, he was putting on flesh, he was setting up his tent in our lives and inside of our situations. When we talk about an intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ here at the crossing, we always use Psalm 23 to kind of describe what that relationship looks like. There's this verse inside of here, and like normal, or usually I have you highlight certain words. This verse is just so good. Imagine all of them are highlighted, all right? Psalm 23, verse four. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, Right now, uh, across all of our locations, you are either uh, walking out of one of these situations, you're in the valley, or you're walking into the valley and you don't know it yet. That's kind of where we live. We're either coming out of the valley, we're in the valley, or we're going into the valley. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, now you end up in the valley of the shadow of death uh, because decisions you make, Uh, circumstances of life, or just because we live in a fallen world, that things like this are just going to happen. Jesus was the best person to ever live, and he spent considerable time in the valley in the shadow of death. But even though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Even though I'm walking into a place that is not good, that is not fun, that is not happy, even though I'm walking into a place that's full of pain and sorrow, and hurt, even though I'm walking in there, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you're with me. I know sometimes you think that in the moment of your pain, your prayers are just bouncing off the ceiling. I know there are times in your pain when you feel like you've been neglected and that God is distant. What I'm trying to tell you is, in your moment of pain, you need not fear because he's with you. This is what the scriptures, this is what God is trying to tell each and every single one of you at all of our different locations. If you're walking through the valley of your marriage right now, your marriage is not what you expected, it's not what you hoped, you're in it right now. You you just got news, you just got word, and you're going, I've got a fight on my hands. What I'm trying to tell you is if you're in the valley of your marriage, Jesus is like Cousin Eddie showing up. and he's setting up his tent in the middle of your marriage. And he's saying, I'm here. 
I'm in this with you. I'm in the valley with you. There's some of you, the hardest thing to do in life is to raise kids, am I right? Will anybody preach, what can I preach that message? I thought marriage was tough until you have kids. Like if we don't change something, they're gonna end up crazy. We can, how do you figure this out? The, the amount of restrictions you have to go through to get a driver's license, but they'll just give you kids. <laughs> Insanity, okay? And nothing affects my mood and my heart like my kids, their problems, their challenges, the, the weight of trying to make sure you're making the right decision. Am I being a good father figure? Am I exasperating my kids? Am I being too hard? Am I being too soft? Or maybe your kids are getting older and they're making decisions and every time they make one of those decisions, your heart is strained and you're going, God, what do I do? Maybe it's a child you've been praying for, hoping desperately that they would begin an intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And I know that there's some of you, you're over here with your kids and you're trying to take care of the kids and figure your stuff out and you feel like you're all alone in your kid's situation, I just need you to know, Jesus is like, so we got kid problems, huh? And he's moving into your challenging situation as a parent, saying, I'm here, man. I got enough stuff in here I can I, for as long as we need to stay here. You're not going through this alone. He's setting up the tent in the middle of it. There, there are some of you right now that you are in the early throes of depression. The lights in just certain areas of your life and your emotions and your thoughts, the lights are just starting to go out. In other areas, they're flickering. Some of you, you're at a spot where you, you maybe don't even realize it yet, but the people around you are starting to ask those questions. Maybe you're at a point where you realize that something's not completely right, but you really haven't got the courage yet to just go and seek some help and at least get some information. Some of you, you're in the throes of the doctors trying to figure out how to dial in the medication just right. And so one day is great and the next day is just horrible and you are in it. And I know sometimes what depression wants to tell you is you're all alone, you're in this by yourself. I just want you to know that Jesus is going, oh, depression, you're in the... I'll, I'll be in this valley with you. You don't have to be in this valley by yourself. I'm here. I'm going to set up my tent. I'm going to tabernacle with you in the valley. And you might be going, but I'm afraid. And he says, you have nothing to be afraid of because I'm here. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. There is Jesus setting up his tent in the middle of your valley. There are some of you right now that you got a bad diagnosis. Maybe you're in a bad diagnosis right now. And man, you're in the middle of doctor's visits and trying to have them figure out what the right treatment is. And you're going, man, I, I'm trying to be optimistic, but boy, it's hard. And you're kind of evaluating your life, like what are all the things I did to get myself in this situation? I, I just want you to know, you might think that you're in the valley and you are, but you might think that you're in the valley alone and you're not. Jesus hears about a diagnosis and he grabs his tent. He says, well, where are we going? Because I'm gonna go wherever, wherever you go, I'm going. You're not going anywhere by, I'm, I got everything I need. I'm here for as long as it takes. You have never been in a situation in your life where he has not been there with you. And so to all of you at all of our locations where you are, in the valley of the shadow of death and you are fearing evil, I need you to know he is with you. Picture number one tells us that he's within you. Picture number two tells us he's there to help you to lift up your prayers to God and to pray over you. And picture number three is to let you see him in every situation of your life. He is not moving out, he is moving in. And if you want to have him in that area of your life, yes, you can begin that intimate personal relationship with him today. We're moving to a time of decision. I believe this sermon speaks to each and every one of us. So many times in life we can keep God at a distance. Some of you today don't have an intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You haven't received the gift that he's given to you to be able to handle all the experiences of living in a fallen world. Today is the day that you need to change that. 
you're broken, you're hurting, and you need help, the good news is that I know the great healer, the one that can heal your marriage, the one that can help fight your addiction, that can pull you through the challenging moments of your life and get you to the other side. When you have an intimate, personal relationship with Jesus, he becomes your guide, your healer, your comfort, and your joy. Hit the life prayer button. Let's talk together about what that relationship looks like. If you already have that relationship, ask yourself this question. Am I living a life that shows Christ living inside me? If the answer is no, then what do you need to change about your life to change that answer to a yes? Are you being distant with God? Is he your God on Sunday mornings and Thursday nights, but during the rest of the week, he's not around? Like Clayton said, when you take on that relationship with Jesus, you become a temple of the Holy Spirit. How does your temple look? Mine needs some works, so that, that's for sure. I'm definitely guilty of only going to God as a last resort rather than a first resort. Right now, let's spend some time examining our hearts and talking with God about how we can be the temples of his Holy Spirit the way he always intended them to be. Let's do that right now. See the tragedy and beauty of the cross. I feel the mystery and wonder of your love. Lord, we marvel at the gift you gave to us and the spilling of your blood. The spilling of your
temple, sometimes we forget what paid the price for that privilege. We forget that our temple was paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. If it wasn't for his sacrifice, we wouldn't have the gifts that God has given to us. We remember that sacrifice every week by taking communion. So let's spend these next few moments contemplating that sacrifice and how we can live a life that reflects it. Let's do that right now.
Thank you so much for being a part of service today. If you haven't already, hit the give button at the top right of the screen. If you have any questions or just want to continue the conversation, you can email me at joeyh at the crossing.net. Thanks again for joining with us and I'll see you next week.